everyone, and welcome to Now and Zen. Today we have Brian Riordan on the show, if I'm saying that correctly. It's actually Riordan. Nobody knows how to pronounce it. Riordan. Oh, okay. It's old Gaelic. Okay. We're so glad to have you on the show. Um, you recently went to Indonesia, and you mm -hmm. won the UN12 2018 competition. You do mm -hmm. a bunch of stuff with electronics. So, I mean, there's so many questions I could ask, but I guess one of the first ones I'd love to ask would be, sure. how did you get started with composing? Um, let's see. So I grew up kind of raiding my dad's record collection and, yes. uh, Santana and Stockhausen were close to each other and being like a four year old kid, just playing around in a record vault, <laughs> uh, not knowing that there's much of a difference between the two, you know, and then yes. later on culture and society had to tell me that, no, those two things, they don't belong next to each other. <laughs> so, <laughs> Unless it's alphabetical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess, which I don't think it's not like his list was alphabetical. I just think it was two S's close to each other. And so maybe he was listening to them side by side but so yeah uh pop music classic rock jazz you know electroacoustic avant-garde music it was all the same to me growing up um but then growing up i just played in a bunch of rock bands uh primarily percussionist um yeah i played drums i played percussion in the orchestra and you know percussion ensembles but my main thing was that i'm a um, hand percussionist and right out of high school, I started traveling to Cuba back and forth. And so, let's see, started jobbing full time um, throughout my 20s. I don't know, for like a full decade, I was just gigging. And then I got to this point where, uh, long story short, I wanted health insurance. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, ah, maybe I'll go get that degree that I never finished. So, yeah, I actually finished up my undergrad when I was like 31 years old. And that's when I met a composer, Jonathan Kirk, who kind of gave me some opportunities to start composing, showed me some stuff. Uh, then I met his teacher, Amy Williams, who is over at University of Pittsburgh, and she grabbed me and brought me over that way. So that's why I'm in Pittsburgh right now. And uh, at University of Pittsburgh, do you know Matthew Rosenblum? He's a microtonal composer, and he also has his own microtonal festival. That happens every two years in Pittsburgh. So just, really? yeah, just by being around him, taking a microtonal class with him, uh, and, you know, doing grad student things like driving the bus for Kyle Gann, you know, driving a van around for these microtonal composers and stuff. That's so, the coolest thing. Yeah, so I just, you know, got to know them a little bit closer and and seen their pieces perform. So, yeah, there's actually kind of a microtonal scene in Pittsburgh. There's a couple composers in town doing some stuff. And, um, yeah, so. That's fantastic. Yeah, I think having Matthew in town is obviously a good thing. So. That's helpful, yeah. So would you say that the composers in Pittsburgh then are staying there, or would you say they're sort of temporary and they're students who might, you know, leave afterwards to get a job It's a little else? bit of both. Um, my buddy Aaron Myers Brooks, he's staying in town. He graduated a couple years ago. He just released a quarter tone death metal album. Which uh, oh, you should, that's exciting. yeah, you should check it out. It's pretty good. He also he's got you know a couple of guitars that are fretted. I think in fourteen. Uh, I know he's got a twenty four, um, but he also composes in different temperaments and stuff. And then there's another guy in town, Devin Tip. He might be just passing through. He's just a grad student at the moment, and uh, he does forty eight, but he bends that a bit from time to time. And really beautiful music. <laughs> Uh, 
so yeah there's a there's a couple other guys in town doing microtonal stuff yeah your statement about 48 reminds me of how john eaton talks about his music that's notated in quarter tones mm. where he doesn't expect it to be strict 24 tone equal temperament mm. but he expects the performers to sort of bend things a certain way based on either just intonation or whatever they would want to hear mm -hmm. would would you say that that's pretty common in like the pittsburgh sort of microtonal school of thought um i mean there really isn't a pittsburgh school like i mean of course there's a school in pittsburgh you know but <laughs> right, but it's but like yeah. school of thought uh first of all like outside of microtonal it's not like everybody here does microtonal stuff um right uh we're kind of encouraged to have our own voice which is really nice uh the three composers that are at pit they're all very different uh they kind of nurture our different strengths and i don't think they want a bunch of clones i've even heard amy williams say that she doesn't want her students to sound like her you know and That's excellent and even with matthew matthew has his own tuning system and we don't use it and he encourages us to use our own system he doesn't you know, he has his thing. He developed it back in the 80s. It's actually really cool. It's uh, I think he's currently using a 21 system, but it's not EDO. It's uh, oh, okay. there's 12 EDO in there. So you can always come back to home and a piano can always play any of those notes. But then he throws in an additional nine tones that are something else. And huh. when you look at the system, it, it kind of makes sense. But even he's like, no, there's it's not like this is a J.I. or a Zen thing or an EDO. Like he's like, these are just intervals that I really liked and then threw them in so that's how his well, system that works pretty sad. yeah exactly so <laughs> that's his system and as i mentioned the two other guys they have their own thing i mean aaron's a guitarist so he's really into oh if he finds a guitar that is in 14 that's he's gonna start doing that kind of stuff and uh i don't know, i mean i do something different i'm a little bit more ji oriented but i'm also not a ji cop about it not a right. fascist. <laughs> so. <laughs> no J.I. fascism here. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Fascinating. So what would you say some of the best ways are to explore the harmonic series? I've seen a little bit of your work, and it seems like a lot of the things you do uh, have to do with the way instruments resonate mm -hmm. and how you bring out sort of the top parts or the bottom parts of that, and then mixing that with electronics in a really interesting way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, like the the piece that I wrote for Calithumpian Consort, that's the one that I submitted for Untwelve. Um, yeah. Uh, it's weird. My main Recorded ruins. Yeah, yeah. My main thing is that I like doing live processing. I like playing the laptop like it's an instrument. And, yes. um, and so I wrote a bunch of pieces that kind of emulate that where a person with a laptop can kind of, you know, like there's a piece I just premiered about two months ago with a cellist, and he's able to perform this piece without me but it sounds like i'm there in the room with him processing him and so that was the point of that piece but then uh i got this is that book burner yeah that is that is so and there's a lot of there's a lot of microtones in that one too so Yeah. Very, very yeah, that's a that's a that's a heavy one. <laughs> so, but uh, so I think it was last year, Stephen Drury contacted me out of the blue. He commissioned me for a piece, said it would pr be premiered with Calithumpian Consort at uh, Sick Puppy, his summer festival. And so I was super excited about that. But he's like, uh, you know, you could do anything you want as long as we're able to rehearse it. And I'm like, I I just didn't know how I felt about sending this complicated electronic piece where they had to set up all these microphones and needed the right 
you know, I just didn't want to send him something that had a performance note that was, you know, 30 pages long and required right. an, <laughs> an engineer. You know, I'm, I'm very performer oriented. I like working within their own, you know, restrictions and limitations and, you know, and, you know, the what's what's great about them. I want to work with their strengths. Um, so I knew I wanted to do something with electronics. and I had to do something completely different. And there's this composer that I really admire. Do you know Per Bloland? He has this thing that he built called the uh, electromagnetic piano. And he basically, I, th I think it's like 15 or 16 of these magnets that are on the lowest register of a piano. And it starts resonating certain overtones within those strings. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. And so he's got some amazing pieces. Um, one piece, he actually plays a recording. I think I could be saying this wrong. Sorry, Pear. Um, <laughs> but I think he plays a recording of one of his chamber pieces and has those overtones resonate out of the piano. It's like sounds like a ghost version of the piece. It's super cool. Um, and so I was talking to him about this. I was like, man, I'd love to do this, but I don't have $10,000 for your <laughs> electromagnetic piano setup. And he was just like, oh, well, do you have 40 bucks? <laughs> I was like, sure. And so he, uh, he pointed me to uh, some transducers. So I started working with mm. um, sound exciters and uh, I bought a $20 amp, got some speaker cable and the um, transducers were like 20 bucks. And basically as long as I'm able to send like square waves, sawtooth waves, um, you know, classical waveforms out, it'll, and put those inside the piano, then I have two resonators. Uh, started playing around with sine tones. Didn't really sound that interesting, believe it or not. As much as I love sine tones, they don't resonate too well through a transducer, but something like a square wave, it's really gnarly. It's a bunch of, you know, 90 degree angles. It's super abrasive. That's enough to get a low piano string to start to ring. And when you're dealing with the lowest piano strings, those overtones go pretty high. Uh, I think, yeah, I think I could be wrong. I haven't, I mean, I, I, didn't, I haven't looked at the piece in a while, but I think I make it up to the 25th. I could make it. 25th up, or I could, I think it's getting up. I think that's where it starts to, I don't know, decay a bit. Um, but yeah, so that's how that that's whole piece amazing. started. So basically, I was like, "Hey, can I send this little transducer and amplifier setup in a in the mail to the pianist?" And uh, all the pianist has to do is plug this thing in, um, simple electronic patch, a little bit of software. I'll send you. Just plug this stuff in, and it'll work. And uh, so it was easy for them to perform. And then from there, the ensemble then tunes to those partials that they're hearing. Okay, awesome. So it actually ends up being pretty easy to play and not all of the mm -hmm. harmonics that the instruments are using are upper harmonics of their strings but they are tuning to some notes that they are getting from the piano strings yeah it's a little bit of both it's a little bit of both and if you think about it the piano uh well the, the electronic setup has two transducers there's a left and a right output it's just stereo the audience doesn't hear it as stereo it's just two separate mm. channels so from there i could use two totally different series right and so for, from from the very beginning two series are different heard you know they're sounded and one instrument might tune to one of them and another instrument might tune to another one of those so yeah it just kind of went up from oh, there that's... So yeah, that was the that was the impetus of that. Yeah, that's really fascinating. It's uh, it's a great work with a lot of uh different texture changes and the soundscapes mm -hmm. sound really mysterious and kind of alive because I think there's a misconception that something can't be zen if it if there's too much of a drone. But you sort of mm. have this situation where you have like a big sound and you're like bringing out sort of these different angles of it and it sounds really really ambiguous. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of interruptions in it, yeah. too. Yeah. So, yeah, there might be a drone for a bit, but then, like, really fast, sparse material might, you know, interrupt that, and that might be one series or the other. It might 
not have anything to do with one of the series. Yeah. You know, because I go into sorry everybody, I go into twelve EDO a couple times in oh, that no. one. Fan so, from the podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At, end of the podcast. It's over. I'm fired. <laughs> so uh, no, but uh I think something to think about when it comes to drones and this stuff is that I mean, spectralism is great music. Yeah. I love it. But there's so many pieces out there where it's like, here's the fundamental and then the series is you know, exposed. Then you hear everything build up from there. You know, like the old Grise pieces. Right. And yeah. I love them. Don't get me wrong, but like I, just, I just it's don't want to do that. It's become a cliche in uh, microtonality for sure. It is. Like it a is. really big. It one. is. Um. Yes. Yeah. So if you're going to use drones, which I love, you know, I just I felt personally I I had to do something different. With yeah. Them. Yeah. In particular, uh, with just intonation, it seems like you get this cool connection to the harmonic series, but it also seems mm-hmm. very hard to uh come up with like systems of part writing in it and then you have to remember what all the notes are and you know i worked with just intonation for a while so i understand Mm -hmm. it pretty well but uh whenever i try to implement it on instruments you know i'm always wondering what to do how did you notate recorded ruins in terms of just intonation did you use like helmholtz ellis or Yes, I did. Yep. So I'm the uh I'm the technical director of a music festival, New Music on the Point, or some people call it NMOP. It's up in Vermont. Right, I'm actually as soon as yeah, as soon as as soon as we hang up, I have some work to do for that <laughs> one. Um we actually have uh John Luther Adams coming in wow, this year. Really? And so we're yeah, so he's gonna be in. We got Pamela Z. I'm super excited about yes. her. But the the resident ensemble is the Jack Quartet. What? Yeah, so every summer I hang with them, and so my first year working with them, I think it was like five years ago, uh, I brought a piece to Chris Otto, and right away he's like, the way you're writing, you need to, you should consider using Helmholtz Ellis. I was Mm. like, really? Why is that? He's like, well, we can sight read this. (laughs) You know, he's like, we don't need to... You know, it's a system that's being used by a bunch of performers and a bunch of composers right now. And it makes perfect sense. So yeah. there's a couple things I'm not crazy about when it comes to the system. Like, have you seen the article? The one with the uh, article I've it's Mark Sabat. I think yeah. he wrote it or Wolfgang von Schweinitz. I, yeah, they, they got together. I've seen that. Well, the tuning system, when you read it, it's all based off of Pythagorean. Yeah. So when they tell you sent deviations, it's sent deviations of the Pythagorean system. Right, which the farther you get out, the more that yeah. is like really convoluted. Although there's kind yeah. of no way around no way around the convolution there. Yes, exactly. So I when I use it, I me personally how I think about it, I'm thinking from EDO. I'm thinking oh, from yeah. equal temperament. So I kind of re- put some notes in there, rewrote the article myself, you know, right, just, yeah. I mean, anyone could do it. So, uh, but, That's uh, cool. yeah. So, but, uh, showing something like that to the guys in Jack quartet, when they see a certain type of hook down, they instantly know that it's a seventh partial of something. Oh, that's exciting. So they just, yeah, yeah. that's really cool. Cause yeah. people have also talked about, uh, Johnson notation, which really mm. does the same thing. Yeah, but it's over the top. Right. And and like the numbers <laughs> yeah. being upside down and it's kind of Yeah. It's well, more Chris confusing. Otto grew up in um he grew up in central Illinois and knew him. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's how he first got started into it and he even commented uh back being like, "Yeah, that notation, it's it's too much information. There's so right, many yeah. <laughs> so many things going on and stuff." And he's all, he even said something along the lines like you could renotate his string quartets with the Helmholtz Ellis system. Ooh. And it would be it would be less cumbersome. It would be less information. Somebody should do that. Maybe I yeah, could. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Well, I mean, some people do that kind of stuff. Like I know this cellist who renotated 17 poems of Lipo. I think that's what it's called. It's all Harry Parch tuning, uh, but the guy worked with the Boston Microtonal Society, so he was really into the Ezra Sims system, and he renotated the whole piece in the Ezra Sims system and then performed and recorded it. Fascinating. So, like, the main... Yeah, the main recording of this. It's it's Ted Mook. Yeah. You know? I mean, I'm sure a couple other people recorded it, but like he he read it in the Ezra Sim system, even those. Yeah. So yeah, somebody could do this for Ben Johnson. I'm sure they can. He sits deep within. Twitching her mouth. Huh? 
eyebrows. Yeah, what's uh, interesting is uh, I've encountered a lot of people who can read in Ezra Sims, so they're basically thinking in terms of 72-tone equal temperament, and then Helmholtz Ellis is thinking in terms of just intonation. But it's also, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. nowadays, it's really hard to find music that strays significantly far away from keys that are easy to read, and only, like, the real, mm-hmm. like, you know, the the super famous people like Ben Johnston and Harry Parch, I guess, get to do that, where mm-hmm. uh, the notation actually has to be robust enough to handle those sorts of weird, complex movements. I wonder how Harry Parch would feel about his piece being played in Ezra Sims. Probably couldn't tell. Yeah, I wonder. <laughs> Yeah, I probably couldn't. I mean, he's a funny guy, though. I mean, you kind of have to have a sense of humor if if you're doing that kind Absolutely, of stuff. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. And I think his pieces uh, convey that a lot, especially with, like, the ridiculous titles and stuff mm-hmm, like that. Mm-hmm. So. What was that uh, album that just got a Grammy, like, in a couple years ago? With the uh, Parch Ensemble. There's a, there's a voiceover in there. I think it's, like, the last track you hear him talking, and it's it's just hilarious. Those who think that hearing or seeing this uh, tragedy produces a catharsis, might like to contemplate the kind of catharsis that is produced by setting it to music and rehearsing it for six months. I forget what he yeah. says, but yeah, was absolutely. <laughs> That's really cool. Well, it's good that we're talking about notation because I think as, as Dorico comes out and as more performers mm. are getting okay with microtonality and microtonality, microtonalists are converting more people to be like them, we're sort of seeing mm-hmm. alternative sets of standards, which is very exciting. Uh, so mm-hmm. how do you feel about on 12's 31-tone equal-tempered standard? Do you feel like that's a good notation to use? And I, you're writing something mm, else. I haven't you're seen it. You're writing something else for the on 12 competition, right, in 2019? Or are you going to be there? Yeah. Uh, I wrote a piece for a duo that's involved with Untwelve. Okay. Um, turned it in. We're still we're still hammering out some details. Yes, awesome. So. But uh, I certainly didn't use thirty one. Right. <laughs> I definitely I definitely did more of a compound JI. I mean, I'm open. I'll, I'm I'm open to work with anything. Honestly, it's just uh, there's certain things that are resonating with me right now. Who knows? Maybe like five years from now, I'll I'll hate JI. And, <laughs> you never know. You know. Yeah. <laughs> like who knows? But this it's where I'm at right now. So to answer your question, or maybe not answer your question, who knows? About um 31 EDO or JI, microtonality, Zen harmonics, and all things horizontal. Um I mean, this is just where I'm coming from. I just see 12 EDO as quantized pitch. And that's not a bad thing. Uh, I just see it as quantized pitch. Um, no differently than 19 EDO, which is really beautiful sounding with its amazing thirds. Um, it's also a new type of quantized pitch. It's a different grid than 12 EDO. Um, so why did we sell on? Why did we settle on 12 EDO? Well, I mean, some people may believe that it's an 18th century capitalist plot to sell pianos. Is it? I don't know. I mean, to be honest, I think it's more of a consensus so that we can all play music together. I mean, the obvious thing is modulations. <laughs> I mean, come on, modulating in the 1700s, 1800s, it's beautiful. It's amazing. And uh, we wouldn't be able to pull that off without uh, having the quantized system. And really, that kind of comes down to so that we can have this consensus so that we can play together. And I mean, isn't that what this is all about? I have nothing against somebody who sits in their uh, basement and makes beats all day by themselves or writes electroacoustic music by themselves. Nothing against that. I think that's amazing. But um, and I do that stuff sometimes, too. But I'm mostly interested in working with people. And if you are going to work with people, you know, friends of yours or friends you haven't met yet, um, you need to have some sort of consensus so that everyone's, you know, 
uh, able to work together. So I don't think 12 EDO or any EDO is a bad thing at all, but specifically 12. Um, I have noticed some comments online, not to call anybody out, but uh, I have no noticed some comments that uh, people believe those who use 12 EDO are more concerned about gigs than making music, <laughs> which is kind of silly to me. I mean, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, but I mean, you know, uh, gig isn't a bad thing, <laughs> especially if it's about playing music with people, you know, um, you know, but, uh, to me it's about who I work with and are they comfortable doing these weird ideas I have, or can they bring something to the table that I haven't thought of yet? You know, I'm not a dictator composer or a musician. I'm all about collaboration, especially improvisation, you know, but going back to this quantized pitch idea as a percussionist, I've observed, quantized rhythm um i've seen many cr like crazy rhythms before i've written some crazy rhythms and most of the time when i put in these crazy complex rhythms it's just to unquantize the 16th note grid um and if you look at somebody like Jay Dilla, flying lotus or even bata drumming from cuba they all work outside of a quantized rhythmical grid and i think that's fascinating you know that said i still like working with the grids the rhythmical grids and i like playing straight ahead grooves with funk groups you know there's nothing wrong with that and i really see 12 edo or pitch as the same way you know 12 edo is um quantized and like rhythm where i try to work around the rhythmical grid i like working outside of the pitch grid as well and that's how I see just intonation. Uh, it might be a grid on its own, but it's not as fixed one like a 31 EDO. You know, 31 EDO sounds great. I just haven't played around with it much myself. You know, uh, the JI system that I work with is elastic and it's fundamental can move around. Like that piece I did, Recorded Ruins, I was working with higher partials on two lower strings and was always asking, what would it sound like? if I had a dyad between an 11th partial of a low B string and a 7th partial of a low D flat string. And I could do that with those transducers, the two different transducers I mentioned. Um, and what could happen if I moved the transducers around to other strings and dealt with other fundamentals? And what type of dyads can I get out of there? And that's just the piano. I still have a violin, cello, bass, clarinet, and trombone, and they can all play their own intervals against any of these sounding pitches. Um, so I like thinking in terms of de deviations of the 12 EDO system, you know, and about how liberating it is to work with these just intervals in so many different ways. I wouldn't be able to accomplish this if I was, you know, using a, a fixed e EDO system. Uh, having said that, I have nothing against other EDOs or EDOs. Uh, I like listening to them. I'm hyped when I hear others try these new things out. I'm actually really excited about my buddy's um, opera that I'm going to see tonight. Curtis Rumrill's opera with uh, this amazing local group from Pittsburgh called Camera Tone. Whole thing's 12 or 24 EDO. Um, but for me, where I'm at now, I have my hands full exploring. <laughs> um, exploring ways of working with you know non-quantized pitch the same could be said for my live processing where i repitch some grains of a trumpet in real time using granular synthesis it's actually a lot easier to program in ji intervals than edos like seriously so much easier if i want to do a seven to four ratio i just type in the number 1.75 i just you know do the fraction figure out what decimal it is and type that in if I were to try to do some sort of Edo, I would have to do complex math. And uh, by that point, the trumpet solo would be over and I wouldn't know what to do. Um, so now, of course, at the end of the day, it's just all about sound for me. I mentioned that before. I'm just, I like the sound. I like the sound of um, 7 to 4 ratio. I love the sound of 11 to 8. But uh, as far as like standards are concerned, I mean, I think it's, I think it's important to have some sense of standard. I mean, we're just talking about 
the Helmholtzellus, you right. know, it, like how so many performers can now look at it and they know, ex oh, this this specific X is that's an 11 to 8 or it's an 11th partial. I just know that my intonation is supposed to go this way, even if the fundamental isn't present, you yeah. know. Um, and so that type of standard is is interesting. But I haven't seen the 31 thing that you're talking about. Right. Well, it's interesting because since 19 and 31 are both mean tone temperaments, mm -hmm. uh, they can both be notated with traditional sharps and flats, which means that you don't have to invent any new funny ones. Although mm. for 31, you can also use sets of half sharps and half flats to fill in some in-between notes if you'd want to, like, flip the letter, you know, if you're in between sure. C and D and you have, I think D double flat is like C half sharp. Mm -hmm. But I might be getting that wrong. Um, but yeah, a whole step is five out of the equal tuning, and a half step is three. So uh, that means that, you know, diatonic music is the same like it is in 19, but then mm -hmm. all the relationships are different. So I'm quite interested in using 31 for, like, a bigger system, and then uh, those other notations seem pretty promising, too. I guess I'm not, like... I never... I almost never write things in a very 12 EDO way... And I think that's actually, like, bad for my career. I was staying up last night working on uh, an ambient track. Because I, I have to release some music every month or I will die of depression. Oh, so. I, I do the same thing. Right. Good or bad. <laughs> right, <laughs> Good yeah. Or, yeah. <laughs> well, it's like I've got that podcast with my electroacoustic trio, How Things Are Made. We're releasing something every Sunday for the year of, you know, 2019. So explain that podcast to me, because I, I haven't listened to it yet, but, you okay. know, I, I'm going to listen to it as soon as as this is <laughs> over, because there's electroacoustic music involved. and Yeah, yeah, totally. It's mostly music and some voiceovers. It's a surrealistic podcast. So the project How Things Are Made began a couple of years ago between some good friends of mine, Matt Elmore and David Bernabo, mm -hmm. and it uh, we just wanted to get together and jam. It's as simple as that. And... Um, at the same time, I was working on my dissertation, uh, which is still going on, um, and I wanted to learn a little bit more about the stuff that I was studying. I'm really into live processing. I'm really into delay-based processes and temporal discontinuity and things that can happen with a computer in real time. Uh, yeah, Using yeah. the laptop more like an instrument and less of a set-it-and-forget-it type scenario. That's the, the best way to do it. Yeah, I use Max MSP, but I also use a couple of other things, too. Um, I don't use Max in a traditional way. Like, I know a lot of composers like to set up, like, a cue system, and here are some samples, and you, you push the pedal, and this happened. Like, I use an iPad, and I usually use something like Lemur, which is also oh, customizable. Okay. So you've got different hardware. Yeah, so I could use as many buttons or knobs or sliders as I like. You know, it's like, oh, if I'm feeling something different today, I could just invent this many sliders. You know, right. so I'm not stuck to a piece of hardware. Um, so really, that whole project just started off as all of us wanted to play, and I was just looking for an outlet to experiment and play around with this stuff. Um, and uh, we compulsively recorded every single session, and it just kind of turned into a joke. I mean, we're equal, <laughs> we're equal parts silly and serious, you know? Sometimes we take ourselves seriously, and other times we're like, oh, well, that was a thing. Um, <laughs> and so, so uh, the name of the project comes from, it's uh, without saying it, because we're always dancing on uh the possibility of getting a cease and desist order um but it's it's <laughs> it's uh it's a harmless tribute to uh, uh certain documentary series that you might have seen that has a very I've similar title heard of it. yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and uh well th that all started because i did receive a cease and desist order once from the eagles and we were just like oh let's roll with this like let's see what? how many of these things we can get we've gone this far and haven't gotten anything <laughs> So, but anyways, that series that I'm talking about, um, this, uh, we basically release things based on how they present their items in their, uh, certain installation. There's, there's 13 episodes, there's four items per episode. And so we're just like, okay, cool. Well, we'll do this and we'll just see what happens when we finish up a season. So we finished up one season. It was just the three of us. And then we actually got our first gig. 
So what? we had no in- we had no intention of playing live. We were just getting together and like recording in a basement or a studio or something. And we kept on changing instruments. Keep in mind, like Matt and Dave, they're one of they play everything. I mean, there's like trumpets, there's synthesizers, there's guitars, there's you know built you know homemade instruments, found objects, stuff like that. Some awesome. spoken word too. Uh, so then the second season the the concept behind it was like okay fine we got this concert let's record the whole thing in one night but there's let's have 13 guests so that's what separates each of these episodes so we actually had a different guest sit in every 25 to 30 minutes and we just you know perform improvise or whatever uh the third one gets crazy we actually did a call for scores oh and so 13 times four, it's, you know, 52 different items, you know, things that, that are being represented. Uh, and so it's 52 different compositions. Oh and my God. Our, I was just kind of getting fed up with, I don't know, call for works in the first place. I mean, hey, I've done them. I, I get it. I mean, it, it's great. I right, think it's yeah. amazing that these opportunities are here. But uh, there were a couple that I've applied for that, you know, never replied never said anything or whatever, which I don't care about, but I had some friends who were getting really offended by this stuff. I'm like your friends. I'm not as cool as you. Yeah. So my, th- my thought was like, well, what if we had a call for works that had a hundred percent acceptance rate? <laughs> <laughs> and did you advertise that on the, yeah, we advertised it. Oh, that's we really got a funny. bunch of them. I think we got like 40 something. Cause like a couple people did duplicate, like did more than one piece. Um, <laughs> and, like uh so yeah and so our deal was okay hold on a second what do we just get ourselves into because now we have to do 52 compositions so our deal yes. was is that these are they're electroacoustic they're live they're semi-improvised they have to be done in a single take so there's no overdubs and we're giving you 30 minutes to learn it and record it holy crap holy. <laughs> and that's so, so, so cool yeah, so so we did it. So the whole thing, it's it's already up there. There's a bunch of composers uh, all across the board. I mean, it's so many different strategies that were done. Uh, the fourth season is a repeat of the second one where we did another concert all in one night with 13 different guests. And then uh, by the time that was done, we're like, well, what are we going to do next? We have to do something totally different for the fifth one. And we realized that we had so many outtakes from the composer series, so many extra live recordings that we did at, you know, random events. And we're just like, well, let's, we have enough of these to release one a week throughout the entire year of oh 2019. God. It's pretty absurd. I, I, we, we know how insane this is. So That's um, just insane. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing and, that you've managed to do it. Yeah, so our our joke was like, well, we kept on releasing all this stuff on Bandcamp as albums, and it's just like there's fifty something of them already, albums. you know. <laughs> and and you know, we know that there's sometimes uh, things work more than others, you know. But the the podcast idea was like, oh, okay, well, that's something that's compulsively released on like a weekly basis, you know. And there happens to be fifty two Sundays in the year. 2019 so let's let's have this be a sunday afternoon <laughs> listening <laughs> experience and uh it's been successful there's we've got a couple thousand streams already so it's it's been a good thing but it's yeah really so, awesome. some of it gets pretty surreal it's like definitely surrealistic stuff oh yeah well that's fantastic yeah so that's the that's the long-winded spiel as to what what's going on in that project <laughs> neat yeah so um are there any times when you all improvise where all three of you have computers? And do you have a lot of different patches that you use for basic improvisations? Because I know that um, with other people, I know that use Max MSP. It, there's supposed to be like, you know, one patch that does it all with like putting a sound in and then mm. maybe you process it any number of ways. But then everyone still approaches it their own way, which I think is yeah. really funny. So what do you kind well, of do for that? That's That's what I think is amazing about uh electronic music now um yeah absolutely. i was listening to you ever listen to the 5049 podcast no but i have had oh. people tell me to oh you should it's amazing yeah there's some great stuff on there so jeremiah simmerman he just you know every week has a different experimental musician on and he interviews them and he had sam pluta up recently and uh sam pluta is a great live processing guy really good composer as well <laughs> <laughs> and 
And uh, he said something I thought was really interesting. He said that over the last 10 years, uh, electronic music, not much has... Oh, I'm paraphrasing this. Who knows if this is correct? But something along the lines of... <laughs> Yeah, something along the lines of uh, timbre hasn't changed much in electronic music in the last 10 years. But what right. has changed is um, how humans interact with the technology. Yes. You know, and a lot of that has to do with just computers are faster. Uh, they're stronger, although they're kind of hitting a brick wall at the moment. That's a whole <laughs> other long-winded story. But um, yeah, RAM is bit bigger, CPU is bigger. Um, you know, uh, think 20 years ago, how often did you see a computer on stage with a band? Well, never For... since I was six. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But and then all of a sudden you get bands like Radiohead, who does right. live processing on every single set they've performed since the year 2000. You know, exactly. And so and they're using Macs as well. Um, and so they're able to do it because the computers are better. But a lot of it has to do with just like computers are just a part of our lives now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we're, we're all just so much more comfortable with them. Uh, I've heard this is going to be a controversial statement for some, but I've heard some people say that uh, electronic music is the folk music of our generation. Yeah, that's that's interesting. You know? Well, because yeah. if you think about it, uh, what is folk music? You know, it's a thing that anyone could play at any right. skill level with an instrument that is just accessible to them. In the past, it might have been just a guitar that's laying around the house, or maybe they yeah. had a piano or something, or a harmonica. But um, yeah, now we all have these dumb computers in our pockets. <laughs> right, yeah. Everybody has you electronics, know? and there's also this big tradition of having those other instruments like piano and guitar and stuff like that so mm -hmm. electronic music maybe tries to pull people out of using those but then mm -hmm. a lot of more accessible music still uses chords and you know sort of square meters sure. so that people can still jump in and play it so yeah which computers could also do that too you know yeah, but yeah, they, exactly. could do, they could do anything i mean they come on it's also the device where you could do your you know taxes on you know <laughs> right exactly <laughs> and and watch videos and stuff so but i think just the fact that it's a part of um our lives a little bit more we're just used to you know interacting with them and the technology's gotten faster um, yeah yeah what what's fascinated me about things like super collider or max msp or actually i know some people are doing some really cool stuff in python right now um is that we can interact with these sounds in real time like right now you know right. it's not like we have to uh okay press record let's go back to the studio let's cut up the tape let's find the part that we like let's slow it down up oh, we got to play it backwards you got to put the tape on backwards or something it's like right, no yeah. i can actually develop an algorithm where i push a button and it does all of that now it's so you know? cool. And, yeah. and so because it could do it right now, you can improvise with it. If you're taking in signals from your from your other performers in your ensemble. And um, so, yeah, I think that's fascinating. And that's that's kind of the route that I've been focusing on. Uh, I've set up a couple of limitations for myself. I almost never use uh, pre-recorded like fixed media. I'm yeah. almost always using sounds of the performers live on stage. And, you know, that's, wow, that's br it, brilliant and really hard to do. Um, yeah, I, I tried it, to do that. It, but it, it turns into what? Wait, what, how, how have you tried to do it? Well, I haven't tried very hard because I'm always composing like microtonal music for acoustic instruments. Sure. But um, I mean, Max is just a little bit of a high learning curve. And I mm. have written like, um, well, I did a lot of things in school where I wrote with Max, but then the end product was always sort of hard to visualize. So it's taken me mm. a long time to be fluent enough with it that I can like imagine the end result and figure out what I want that to be and then have the program dictate that instead mm. of really sort of having the program's limitations affect the piece more. Very good. That's I think that's a huge issue today. I, I hear that a lot where a lot of people like their compositions are dictated by the software. It should be the other way around. And, it's, it's the workflow. Yeah. Yeah. What I think is amazing about these programming environments is that you it's the Wild West. You know, yeah, like yeah. to me, it sounds like you might have been lost in the woods a little bit. You're like, well, where do I take this? Where do I go next? And then maybe I have the idea. How do I program it? But I, I just think programming is easier today. And there's so many resources. There's so many, you know, I teach a max class right now to absolute novices and I have them all programming by the end of the term. And yeah. so there is a learning curve. But I think if you just stick with it and but you're right, aesthetically, I think 
uh, a big challenge for many is like, what am I even going to use this thing for? Like, what do I even want it for? But like, I, I think I had that end goal in mind is that I wanted to be, you know, chopping up and glitching out, you know, real time audio signals like with a you know i just like the idea of a laptop being on stage and honestly a laptop might be extinct in a couple of years maybe it'll be some other new type of technology or whatever but it's just the fact that technology is on stage and there's a person who's manipulating it in real time that's that's fascinating to me yeah i think uh anything that you can do in electronics to preserve the performance element of the whole situation is going to be really exciting for people so yeah. anything Anything that's processing sounds in real time where you can identify uh, timbral similarities between processed sounds and real sounds that are happening. So that's really mm -hmm. good for what you're doing. And of course, pieces that have interactive components that use gestures that are also connected to the sounds. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's why um, the only piece that I have out with Maximus P right now is this one where I have um, I have a bunch of different squares on the screen and mm -hmm. they are just noodling around. And it's very like 1950s. Uh, that's cool <laughs> sine wave kind of things but yeah it was pretty neat i used jitter for it and all of the things that oh. i'm doing on my laptop even though i'm not like waving my arms around or dancing or anything I'm, I'm just using a pedal um it's pretty obvious that i'm controlling the squares and that the music is doing something with that so there's okay. some kind of visual component Cool, so. cool. How is it 1950s? Are you saying like the, the waveforms that are coming out or? It's like, you know how uh, there were sine waves yeah. used a lot and yeah. that was sort of like a heavy thing because people were just discovering that. So they just had that sort of thing. So it's a lot of that, basically. There's some of those, some of those tones used in certain ways, I think are still timeless. Yeah, I'm, absolutely. I'm still, I'm still hearing amazing stuff done with sine tones. They've got a distinctive <laughs> sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, going back to this whole like microtonal thing, uh, I know you you interview a lot of people. And you talk about software or whatever. Oh yeah. Um, like Matthew Rosenblum, he's really big on using contact. You know, he yeah. he just puts in a sample library, retunes everything from there. Uh, I just do it at Max. I do sign tones. Yeah. You know, it's just Max it it's good. actually super fast. It's super fast. Like I mean. And, uh, you know, I already paid for it. I don't need to pay for any more software. Right, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Again. I could just build my own plugins and my own software and stuff. So, yeah, but yeah exactly. uh, it's so sine tones are great because they have no overtones and you could see how a pure tone interacts with something else, you know, and it's, it's nice. Yeah. And there's also with sine tones, I think there's also a lot of trickery and cheating you can do because if you have any given uh, kind of sound, yeah. There's going to be a lot of detail in it that gives you clues about its intonation or some other broader context. And with the sine wave, you essentially get zero clues. So I've, you know, gotten people to say that a perfect fourth sounds like a minor third before with sine waves. So. Oh, yeah, that that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, because if it's just a constant in an interval and they know it's not an octave, they're like, oh, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of this. Right, yeah, it's like, it has to do with the difference between, like, neighborhoods and, like, giving more detail that sort of mm -hmm. gives that information away. Although with the perfect fourth, I think harmonically, probably they wouldn't say that anything was a minor third, but I was doing some melodic tricks where, mm. you know, in lots of Zen harmonics, you have a, you have sort of how the melody goes in time, moment to moment and i guess i would call that like immediate mm -hmm. horizontal movements and then there's sort of a destinational horizontal and mm -hmm. i'm like working on expanding the vocabulary about this because sure. i don't know if there are really any words for it but it's like the the distance between sort of the final or destinational horizontal and the immediate horizontal really matter with how like where people think of the interval is because some mm -hmm. people are better at you know getting to the end and then figuring out 
that that beginning tonic note is somehow like really different from it. And some people are going very moment to moment and they think that like, you know, say the last note sounds like it's a perfect fourth higher in the moment to moment, but it's actually a minor third. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I find those um, contradictions between apparent relationships really interesting. Is that something that you explore in Just Intonation a lot? Hmm. I, I mean, I don't think I've thought of it that way. I'm always trying to do something different, even though some of the stuff might even sound the same <laughs> at the end or whatever. But I just, I think I'm just not comfortable sitting in the same place uh, for too long ever. Yeah, me neither. Anything, yeah, you know? I never do that. And, yeah. Yeah. Which is why I said, who, who knows, maybe five years from now I'll be done with JAI. But right now that's the, the world I'm swimming in. <laughs> Would you say, because there are lots of different reasons that people use JAI, you mm -hmm. don't seem like a guy who has to like have harmonic purity or he'll be upset. Mm -mm. So mm -mm. I, I mean, would you say you use JAI because it usually creates like really interesting timbres and uh, mm -hmm. performers sort of know what it is. Would you say that yeah, those are two it, big reasons, sir? Like the first time I ever really listened to a seven to four. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, whoa, that's what a flat seven supposed to sound like. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's you know, exciting. It's got really fuzzy and juicy and no, it's just, I, I really liked it. Um, yeah, so I mean that alters the timbre. It actually sounds like a synthesizer. It's like additive synthesis. Yeah, it is. You know. Yeah. And exactly. so I think that's why I was in it. I just wrote a piece for. Um, do you know this duet called Anne Play? No. They're in uh, New York. Uh, the violinist is actually in Mivos Quartet. If you're familiar oh, with them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's violin and viola. They are wonderful performers and wonderful people. It's great working with them. And I started off this piece. It's just filled with J.I., but in the end, it ended up not being a J.I. piece at all. I even asked them, I was like, w was some of this stuff necessary? Because it's moving so fast. And uh, I, it's not that I was really going for a seven to four right here. I just notated it that way. I just wanted the sound, you know? And they were like, yeah, it, it makes sense you notated it this way. But it, it, when you first glance at it, you think it's going to be one thing. But the sound is something completely different. So, I mean, that's the thing is that if you're going to use quantized pitch, I think there's so much... Uh, I don't want to use the word baggage but like there's so much history there you know like we we know what 12 edo sounds like everyone does you know yeah but the second you make something flat or sharp just by a little bit um it just changes the timbre and stuff so i don't think i was yeah. really going for it's what it's like the first microtonal piece that i wrote where it wasn't like this is the pitch it's not like it's a pitch class or microtonal pitch class. It's like super important. It's just like, oh, these sounds. Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, isn't, isn't, that, isn't that what this is all about anyways? We're just playing around with sound. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you, can't, yeah you can't get too anal about whether something is dead on. Uh, yeah. Of course, that depends on the context. I'd say in a lot of situations where there's J.I., uh, even if the pitch isn't dead on, if your ear gets the sense mm -hmm. that things are blending in a slow context, then yeah. that's enough to make it work. Even yeah. if the pitch is significantly lower or higher than J, which mm -hmm. of course can happen, absolutely uh, depending on what you're working with. But violins are definitely, um, at least according to what I have seen and read, more more accurate in like what's going on in reality versus how just your ear thinks it is. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense too. So, well, uh, something else to think about too, beyond just the sounds that we're talking about. I mean, you just mentioned the instruments. Yeah, you know, we're you you have to deal with the limitations of the instrument. You also have to deal with uh, we're working with people. Right. You know, yeah, yeah. I'm just this dude who puts like notes on a piece of paper. Actually, I put it on a computer and press, <laughs> <laughs> press you, print on the PDF. You even know, better. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, none of that means anything if it's impossible to play. Right. It does. It's, it's, you know, my idea, unless I'm going straight electroacoustic, which is cool. I mean, and 
like I've heard some of your stuff and I know some other people who are doing microtonal stuff uh, just as like electroacoustic pieces. And that makes perfect sense to me because you're like, well, you know, who cares? I, I guess a person can't play this or maybe that's not the point. These are the sounds I want to hear, you know, yeah, it's but right if you're, there, yeah. if you're having uh, a piece that's going to be performed, you know, there's there's people involved and, you know, yeah. you want them to be comfortable. You're asking them to work outside their comfort zone. Some of them might not understand why you wrote something as an eighth tone you know <laughs> like i i knew this clarinetist who didn't accept that there's anything beyond a quarter tone oh wow what? yeah and yeah it just wouldn't <laughs> but by the end of the performance was a believer you know what i'm saying so it's like <laughs> they came in with this comfort zone of like you're you're forcing me to do something I don't want to do it. I'm like, well, I don't want to force you to do anything. So I think it's interesting comfortable. when people yeah. have views that sort of aren't engaged with reality because they they haven't, you know, taken that dive. And yeah. sometimes it can be really easy to convince people of that, but sometimes it can be really hard. I remember Harry Parch saying that he could count the number of people who couldn't hear an adjacent 14 cent difference on one hand. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just I mean, so funny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, that's that's a fifth partial too. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, exactly. I, I don't know if I could hear it like side by side. I I don't even have the best ears. By well, the I mean, way, so. <laughs> well, I mean, side by side, just alone with something that's not a sine wave that gives you yeah, that clue. I see. It's a see. lot easier because I there's definitely situations in microtonal voice leading where if you've got a pretty tiny step, if you're moving mm -hmm. from chord to another chord. Unless you make it obvious using some other kinds of devices, a really tiny step can get lost, which is why uh -huh. I think tonality flux is so cool. I don't know if yeah, you've ever used yeah. that. No, no, I haven't. What is oh, it? It's really fun. Um, It's basically just microtonal voice leading in the broadest sense. And I think mm -hmm. Harry Parch coined the term, but uh, it gets you to notice those really small steps because there's a lot of ways where if you have, you know, major minor triad or something like that, and just move all the steps a really tiny amount in certain directions, you can get some other major minor chord. Um, mm -hmm. A really famous example is um, if you move... Oh, I'm trying to think about this. There's an enharmonic example that Terpster gives in his mm -hmm. paper, and it's actually even in my, in my software. Um, yeah, if you take a major chord and you move the root up by you know a diesis essentially mm -hmm. which in 31 tone equal temperament is just one of the one of little the steps. step right yeah which is the diesis in that and the, the semitone of i don't know is it a semitone <laughs> what it's, is it it's a lot smaller it's around yeah. like 35 i don't yeah. know what that i don't know what the real diesis is in ji but yeah. i know in 31 tone equal temperament it's pretty close to like 32 or 33 mm -hmm. or 35 cents so so tiny but noticeable so that moves up one. You get mm -hmm. a minor chord that is that has an enharmonic relationship instead of a diatonic or a chromatic relationship. So it would be like um, C E G moves to C half sharp. And G half sharp's the top note. I don't know. Mm. The middle note is off the top of my head. I guess I guess C sharp minor would move that a little bit flatter, so C sharp, E, G sharp moves down a half sharp to C half sharp, E half flat, G half sharp. <laughs> and that's and that's C half sharp minor. Oh no, that's really weird to mix sharps and flats. If you're not used yeah. to that. And I'm probably wrong and people can look it up and correct me and actually comment on the show. So that'd be cool. I don't, I don't know. Is there a right or wrong stuff for this? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there is. Or, or there would be a right or wrong answer. You could go directly to Terpster's website or use oh, 31 yeah. tone notation and try it out. Because like I've I've got my keyboard over here and, you know, I use a Halberstadt keyboard for big mm. EDOs. And then I use my pink one for for small EDOs or like pretty mm -hmm. reasonable subsets. Wait, speaking of, of big, big EDOs, what's your macrotonal stuff? What what oh. uh, What's your system there? Microtonal etudes, um, those are actually really, really small EDOs. So, oh, okay, but isn't that the, uh, see? I, I always we always joked about mac. We're gonna write my macrotonal music, right? And we thought macrotonal would be larger than twelve hundred cents. Oh, so like, uh, <laughs> like, like larger macro. than an octave? Yes, larger than an. But but not not something that's an EDO of some sort. It would just be like. <laughs> Just we're like talking big. about like a couple pitches per 
piano. Oh my god, <laughs> yeah. that'd be so funny. How about this? Uh, I should plug the whole yeah, Ooh, thing plug. I did in Indonesia. Plug everything you're working on, yeah. Oh, God, I'm working on too many things. You already heard about how things are made. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, I have a piece that's uh, premiering at New Music on the Point pretty soon for two bass drums, transducers, and saxophone. That's going to be cool. Um, but... Uh, it's it kind of sounds like doom metal. <laughs> I'm yes. like pretty excited, pretty excited about it, and it's a, and it's all just a bunch of crazy overtones emitting from the bass drums or whatever. But uh, the other awesome. thing is that I'll send you this link. Uh, I recently played in Indonesia, and uh, I played in a pop band dressed as cowboys. Uh, on uh, <laughs> how do I say this? Everything I say is is true right here because it sounds totally insane this is like uh, tantalizingly interesting for our oh closing. it's so strange yeah uh it's without question the most i do a lot of absurd things this one's out there there's yes. a style of music in indonesia that's very popular it's called dangdut it's like uh i like to describe it as hank williams meets bollywood what? It's like yes. <laughs> yeah, it's like classic <laughs> it's like classic rock for you know uh, for Indonesia and it's like really interesting harmonic progressions really interesting arrangements but they have an instrument that's kind of like tabla in it it's called gendang it's not quite a tabla um, and then there's like guitars keyboards flutes vocals and stuff like that and huh. So this ethnomusicologist at Pitt, uh, Andrew Weintraub, he's like the premier scholar on the genre of Dandut, and it was the, uh, Dandut, sorry, I pronounced that wrong. And it was the 70th anniversary of the U.S. Embassy. And so we basically went down and performed eight gigs. <laughs> Across the whole country, we were in an airplane like every other day. I I swear we spent more time in airplanes, airports, hotels, <laughs> dressing room. Like I I swear I didn't like see too. I did see some gamelan though, uh, and I did hear some local music. <laughs> So awesome. out with a lot of musicians musicians and stuff but anyways i performed on national television for I don't, the number keeps yes. changing i need to figure this out but the last i heard is that our audience viewership in real time was 140 million people <laughs> And when I see when I sh uh, I'll send you this link because it's it's surreal. It's 
Um, it's a production that's like bigger than The Voice, like bigger than American Idol. There's like holograms and stuff in the background, and like what? a giant laser cowboy hat floating above us in the background. This is so <laughs> awesome. Like, yeah, Man. and yeah, and it's a predominantly Muslim country, um, and everyone's super friendly there. It's a really great place, and uh, you see the camera pans out to the audience, and it's a bunch of. People, you know, a bunch of women in hijabs, like dancing, like getting down, and yes. <laughs> so, but it's good, it's great, you know. Inspiring. So, yeah, yeah, and uh, but uh, no, I have a little bit of uh, experience with Indonesian music because of the um, at the musicologist at Pitt, and uh, we have a gamelan set here, and I was privileged enough to actually tune a set one time. Oh, like and when so, you were in Indonesia or in Pittsburgh? Here in Pittsburgh. And here yes. in Pittsburgh, I actually got to tune a set. And it was kind of an eye-opening experience because, you know, it's a, it's a thing where a lot of people think like slender tuning is a thing. You know, they think it's they think it's like very specifically like a set of intervals. It is not, you know. Really? Uh, no, That's it's fascinating. Not. Yeah, I think it's been approximated in the West. Like when people say, oh, I use slender tuning, it's like an approximation to, to something, especially if you open up like a sample kit, something like contact or whatever. Right. Maybe it's like 5 EDO or it's a 10 EDO or, so, or some people think it's like approximating to a 14 EDO. When we tuned this set, we just like walked around the room and sure, it's pentatonic. But we walked around the room and we're like, all right, everyone hit the first note. All right, we all heard the first note. Uh, I think it's closest to this one. Let's all shift them to that one. And then the ah, second yeah. note, what's it? All right, uh, I think it's closest. To let's shift to that one. We never measured. Interesting. We never measured. Yeah, wonder- and that's kind of how it's done. Now, you know, if there's a, a, a Indonesian ethnomusicologist out there to correct me, you know, tell me I'm wrong. But I know for a fact that it's definitely not a 5 EDO. Oh, yeah, you know? it's, uh, I, I'm sure that it's not 5. Uh, there have been yeah. lots of people who have said that it's, Things that are near five with slight inequality. Yeah, but even even that, like, you go to the next town and they tune it differently. And right. why do they tune it differently? It's as simple as, like, oh, they all kind of went out of tune. And the second note, like, out of our whole gamelan set, the second key was, like, pretty close to this one. So we'll, we'll all tune it. Yeah. I love it. I guess that must have been how, like, earlier Western music was, too, before there was, like, a tuning standard for A and stuff like that, where all the organs were yeah. different. But the relationships between uh tones and semitones might not have been super different since they're Mm -hmm. describing things in terms of mean tone well that's that's really fascinating you provided a lot of insight on like the gambling situation there (laughs) yeah well and so that's like just to to wrap things up the very first gig we played was in this islamic center in this town called probolingo actually i think we were like 45 minutes outside of probolingo i just remember we flew from you know, Pittsburgh to DC to Tokyo to Jakarta, slept in the Jakarta airport, then flew to Surabaya, stayed there for a night, then got in a van and drove a couple hours to make it to Probol no, to Surabaya. Oh no, yeah, from Surabaya to then Probolingo. And then from there got to our hotel, then went another 45 minutes to this <laughs> Islamic center. So th- we had just been traveling nonstop. It's been like three or four days yeah and we're all jet lag or whatever we go and we play our first gig in this in uh this in, uh islamic center and there's a gamelan set and the gamelan they were playing as you know we came in and it was super cool but we started playing our first tune which is like a legendary song uh it's by this guy romi Yarama. he's like their elvis out there and as soon as we started playing this tune Everyone in the audience knew what it was. They all started clapping like, oh, I know this song. And the gamelan started playing along with us. <gasps> and keep in mind, too, this is a very large room. And they're like, you know, 50 to 100 feet away from us. So there's a time delay. And, oh, they're, in, and they're in whatever tuning they are in. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> and we're using guitars. <laughs> you know oh, what I mean? so that could be pretty, pretty dissonant. <laughs> yeah, so that was our first, that was our first gig. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. yeah, so that, that redefined uh, a microtonal experience. The gamelan and 12-tone equal tempered instruments playing together, you know. 
That's so cool. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, but anyways, uh, Indonesia was definitely the weirdest and most amazing week of my life. And uh, I have more pictures and videos of me in that week. But by the way, Jakarta is like one of the selfie capitals of the world. They're really into social media and selfies and stuff. And so we had pictures <laughs> of pictures of us e- endlessly. It was just endless. It was like my, my face hurt by the end. It was... The internet was destroyed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The internet definitely in Southeast Asia was destroyed, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, then, and then I came back to Pittsburgh after that, and I played uh, a DI DIY show in this old warehouse for like an audience of six people and I was like yes finally <laughs> I was like I was like oh, I'm back home yeah <laughs> that's funny excellent so cool all right anything else man um no I don't think so um thanks for being on the show hopefully I get that one album out before you get this out <laughs> yay awesome it's not like I have enough stuff going on so that'll be your incentive to finish the album oh of course it, it actually I was thinking about that it'll be my incentive to finish it so I, cool. I need to promise more people that I'll have music written for them by certain dates that I actually write it cause like oh. if I just do it on my own you know there won't like it won't happen really um oh yeah having deadlines for an ensemble or like even just like a friend who wants to hear your music and i'll be yeah. like i'll have it by this day and then if you don't they wonder what's wrong with yeah you, you got to give yourself these mile markers or else it won't go down so that's cool so. awesome man well hey thanks so much i appreciate it bye <laughs>
Can you get that? 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 Can you get